Hi, everybody. I'd like to welcome everybody to today's webinar. I'm really excited about it. Before we get started, I just wanted to quickly uh, give a shout out to all my friends up in uh, up in Burlington who are joining us. Um, appreciate you guys taking some time to, to be on the line today. So uh, we'll have to make this one a real special one for you. Um, this this session today, we're really going to talk about a couple of reasons. Number one, uh, give me a chance to, to chat with uh, a couple of my favorite people, Rachel Happy and, and Adam Zhao, who's a, a client of ours at Palladium Group. Um, but also because this is a topic that has been suggested several times uh, during webinars in the past. And it's around the community maturity model. So uh, we're going to get into this topic in a lot of detail in just a minute. But before we do, uh, I'd like to run through real quick just some ground rules for you. First off, uh, if you have any questions, if you have any questions at all today, we encourage you to participate and join in the conversation with us. And there are two ways you can do that. First is is the uh, the non-social media way, and that's using the, the Q&A button at the lower right-hand corner of the WebEx panel. So uh, if you're looking at the WebEx screen, if you just go to the lower right, you see the Q&A box, feel free to submit any questions throughout the section. What we'll do is have a have a dialogue with Rachel and Adam at the end of the session, um, and you know, we'll ask every question that comes up, or at least as many of them as we can. Uh, second thing, you can do is you can tweet any questions that you have uh, on Twitter, and you can follow um, any key points or, or, or share any any useful pieces of information uh, on Twitter using the using the uh, hashtag Pound Awareness Inc. That's all one word, Awareness Inc. And, and we'll have that on the uh, slides going forward. So if, you, if you're not going to remember it right now, um, don't worry. We'll keep reminding you throughout the session. So before I get into before we get into the um, into the session itself, I want to give you a quick overview of awareness, who we are, what we do. Um, awareness is a social media marketing software company, and and what we do is we power external facing communities for some of the largest brands um, around. We help them support their social marketing activities through the communities that we build for them. And some of the customers we work with are certainly names you've heard of. I won't go through each and every one of them, um, but we have a lot of experience in the space. We have a lot of experience helping organizations. Uh, figure out how to use social media uh, to power their marketing initiatives. One other area that you know is, is kind of interesting, and I noticed as we were looking at the at the list of attendees for today, that there's a there's a fair number of of marketing and advertising agencies on the line with us to it today. So welcome to everybody from the marketing and advertising world. We do a lot of work with um, with a whole host of different marketing and advertising agencies around the world, big to small, um, the big guys, and you can see on the left hand side the ones that we work with along with the more boutique firms uh, that specialize in social media. And what we do is we, we actually work with them uh, on a complicated basis, providing the technology to support the communities that they're building. Our partner, the agencies, they provide the services, and in the end we have a whole bunch of happy customers. Um, we try to make it really simple for them. So if you are an advertising agency and you're on the line, we'd love to chat with you. In more detail, feel free to uh, drop me a note directly. Uh, it's easiest to get in touch with me on Twitter. I'm Boston Mike on Twitter, so feel free to just drop me a note. Um, finally, I wanted to tell you a little bit about what our product uh, offering is. Awareness is a software company, first and foremost. And what we what we built is is uh, a series of seven what we call best practice communities. And and basically, what happened was we we had been working with a lot of companies who were coming to us saying, you know, we want to get into social media. Uh, you guys are the experts. Tell us how to do it. And what we found was that Organizations were actually falling into a specific set of marketing and, and social media use cases. So what we did is we used our platform to develop prepackaged communities that we can get up and running rapidly for, for the customers that we work with. We change the branding. We give you the same look and feel that you need. And we get these running so you can start to measure the success of, of your social media activities through our communities. And, and again, we, we've included all the best practices inside these, these template communities that we can launch incredibly rapidly, and so the customers that are using them get an advantage from day one that we have these things launched. What's really cool about them and what gets me, what gets my juice to flow as a marketing guy is built in to each one of them are a specific set of ROI and dashboard metrics. This is really cool. If you think about it, and our CTO Dave Party uses this example all the time, and I think it's a great one, if you're building a peer support community and you're measuring page views, that's probably not the best metric to use because chances are a high number of page views uh, means the customers are, are poking around the site and can't find the answers that you're looking for. So in a peer support community, we're tracking uh, result, issues that have been resolved, and we actually associate a number to that. So from a, from a customer service perspective, you can go back on a daily, weekly, monthly, quarterly basis 
and actually see how much money you save using that, that peer support community. And that's great from a, from a, from an internal perspective. We can actually go and support your social initiatives, uh, to the executives or to management and let them know how successful your community is. So, uh, that's the kind of stuff that gets me really excited. We also have a social mining tool that can actually mine all the, all the, the members that are part of your community and start to segment them out and target marketing programs with them. And we also, uh, work with, uh, sentiment monitoring as well, both internally and externally to the community. So we have a full service suite, a full service social media, uh, platform. If you have any questions about it, feel free to give me a buzz and, and we can talk about it in more detail. And I promise, up front for everybody on the line, that is absolutely the last little pitch you're going to get on the line. The rest of the stuff is going to be some really great knowledge. And I've had the chance to, to look through this presentation already and, and chat with both, with both Rachel and, and Adam about everything. And this is just going to be something that I think everybody's going to get a lot out of. Um, for those of you that don't know Rachel, uh, I'll give a quick intro, and I know Rachel can introduce herself um, as well, but Rachel's actually been a, a, a product management professional software company for, for a while and actually moved on to become an analyst at IDC. Uh, she's currently the, the principal, one of the principals, uh, along with, uh, with Jim Storer, another guy who wears his Red Sox hat and his Twitter picture, so we like him a lot. Um, currently the principal's at the Community Roundtable. Uh, which is a great group, and any community managers on the line right now, I can't recommend them enough. They they provide a lot of knowledge and a lot of insight for community managers, and Rachel will talk about it in a little more detail. And also on the line with us, I'm really excited um, to introduce is Adam Zell. He's a he's a B2B community executive, and he's actually been on the B2B side for a while, building communities. He's on a second go around uh, now, facilitating a community for one of our clients, Palladium Group, in their XTC community. So. Um, I'm really excited to have to have both of you on the line, and, and uh, welcome to the session. Thanks, Mike. Thanks uh, I'll, I'll kick it off and just uh, tell you a little bit about who we are, which is Jim and I, when we formed the Community Roundtable, we saw a need in the market for better education and definition around what community management meant to large organizations, and in particular, online community management. Um, so we're a peer network for community managers, social media managers, um, and we run programming and events meant to help educate and help um, foster conversation between peers. Um, and we do that for everyone, um, as people as big as uh, SAP and AMC, uh, through to nationwide Special Olympics, people like the New England Journal of Medicine are all members. So we're really trying to be cross-disciplinary about that because we believe that there's a lot to learn from each other at this point in the market about what it means to do community management. Um, having said that, um, I want to kick it off a little bit and talk about really what what is community and what, what community is not. And I think many of us know this already, but community is not really about the tools. Um, tools are really important enablers to community. They allow the transactions to happen easily and quickly. But ultimately, community is really about the people and the discussions and the passions um, and ultimately about the relationships between people in the community. Um, if you're not building strong relationships between your community members, um, it's more of a loose network. And those, those strong relationships between people um, are actually what really drive engagement and renewal and passion and, and the long-term commitment that you get from communities. So with that, I want to have Adam just give his brief kind of perspective on what Palladium Group's community is, what they're doing with that, um, and then we'll jump back into a little bit of theory. We're going to jump back and forth between Adam and I today, so you get a, a theoretical view from me and then a practical view from Adam, which I think is a great way to do it. So Adam, you want to tell us a little bit about your community? Sure. Thank you, Rachel, and thank you, Mike, for inviting me to the webinar. So our community is uh, called the Execution Premium Community, and I am the community facilitator. So it's a uh, full-time job for me, managing the community here, and uh, Palladium Group is about a 300-person uh, firm. It's, a, it's primarily consulting, but it's, it's broader than that, and I'll, I'll describe a little bit later what, uh, all, all the different areas, uh, the things that we do. Uh, maybe some of you have heard of the balanced scorecard. If you're at a large organization, about half of the large organizations worldwide use the balanced scorecard as a methodology for uh, developing and executing the strategy. So it you know, starts with the CEO all the way through, through the organization. It was developed by uh, professors uh, Bob Kaplan and, uh, 
and David Norton at Harvard, and they, they did two things uh, that really, um, uh, well, that they made this, that made this community possible. The first is they kind of developed a worldwide community, a you know, you know 1.0 human community of followers of of people who use this methodology inside their organization. So there's already really you know tens of thousands of people out there who are using it. So there's a natural community out there, and then they also launched this consulting firm, which is now Palladium Group. And it's kind of coming together uh, now that we have the tools to, you know, really have a homeland for the community that, that has already existed. So now, we're, now we have kind of a Web 2.0 community version. But a lot of the obstacles that other organizations might have in terms of building a community, we, we already have that. So we're kind of a, a, a step ahead. Back to you, Rachel. I actually do want to point out that most companies do have an ambient community somewhere, or many ambient communities. A lot of bringing it online is just energizing it and giving it that homeland. So that's a great way to put it. Um, the first thing I want to talk about is the dynamics of community, and it's particularly since there's a lot of marketers on the phone. Um, I, I talk about community management strategies as being, being measurable but not correct, which is a little tough to handle in a marketing department because traditionally we kind of think of things as brand marketing or direct marketing, and I think of community as somewhere in between. So, for example, um, most direct marketing where we're talking directly to customers, we have some kind of direct result from our investment, um, and we know how to scale that. If we do 2x, we get 2x in return. If we do 4x, we get 4x in return. We know how to scale that up in a kind of direct fashion. Um, the problem is with communities is even in the best case scenario where you have this geometric growth, um, it's it's lumpy. Um, communities do not really have that. You do something one day and you get a response and and a benefit the next day. It's typically you do stuff over time and you get some benefits later on down the line and you can't really predict specifically where those benefits are, but you can, over time, measure those benefits. Um, the ideal community is this geomatic you know, growth pattern, but the, the more likely scenario is it's really a lot more lumpy than that. And what I'm seeing lately, um, because a lot of people go into this thinking, I'm going to grow this huge community, um, they go out and do this huge marketing push, get a lot of people to come to the community, and then it falls off. And, and part of why this is happening is because communities are relationship-based. They're not just websites with content on them. So if you drive a huge number of people all at once to a community site that doesn't already have some relationships built up, um, it doesn't look much more – well, it, it tends to look just like a website with a lot of content on it. So I, I half-jokingly wrote this blog post once called um, – Managing a community is like making risotto. You can only grow it um, incrementally, meaning if there's 100 people in the community and you invite 2,000 in, all of those 2,000 people cannot be welcomed sufficiently by the people, the 100 people in the community. So you need to kind of moderate the way you grow your community because I would much rather have a small, small community with a lot of activity and passion, and that will naturally and organically grow that community. Um, and then if you do really go out gangbusters and try and get people in the community um, and it doesn't work, bringing them back for a second time can be really hard. So one of my pieces of advice is shoot for engagement as a metric rather than volume, particularly early on. Um, because even in the best communities where you do have the CMS strict growth, there is a long period of investment before you get to your return. Um, so that's something that everyone should keep in mind, particularly in areas of business where um, you're used to thinking about budgeting and ROI and more of a campaign-based uh, scenario. It can, it can be a little hard to get your heads around it. And from a management perspective, uh, it doesn't fit in with everything else. So it, it can be really kind of hard to, to readjust your expectations in that way. Um, and also, this, the second thing to keep in mind is that communities go through phases. Um, they look really different from a management perspective in the beginning 
than they do further on when they're more mature. And that's really the heart of what I want to talk about today is how that changes and, and what you need to focus on in each phase of, of your community life cycle because it does change and the priorities are a little different. Um, and one of the things that we've put together is something called the community maturity model. And we think this is a fairly universal framework for most communities um, in that there's eight competencies that you really need to think about around your community. And if you optimize on any one or two of these without thinking of the other um, of the competencies, you end up creating more friction within your operations than solving problems. For example, if you go out and decide to just use Twitter and you try and maximize that, but then you haven't really thought about why you're doing it or develop the culture internally for really communicating uh, directly and in the conversational method with your customer base, um, you can cause a lot of problems because issues will come up and you don't have a plan to necessarily deal with them or resolve them or respond to them. Um, so it's really important that you look at each of these competencies and do a little bit of each as you mature along with the curve. Um, Secondarily, there's, there's these different phases all the way from kind of a hierarchical approach to a more networked one that, that really require different competencies and they have different barriers to, um, to maturity. Um, and that's what I want to start talking about, which is phase one is you're, you're a mostly hierarchical organization, maybe even a little matrix. Um, there's a lot of benefits to this phase when you're thinking about doing community because everybody's pretty frustrated with some of the effects of having siloed information and decision-making flows. Um, there's a real focus in a lot of companies on streamlining the customer experience, so that doesn't look as lumpy or uh, differentiated as they go through their own life cycle as a customer. Um, and there's a real motivation to change and find better solutions to all of these problems. Um, one of the things that is really important to focus on in this phase is what is the problem you're trying to solve and and how how culturally accepting is your organization of some of these different methodologies. And I really maintain that it's far, far better to be realistic about the scope of what you can and can't do within the framework of your business and your culture. Um, than to try for community utopia because that doesn't really exist anyway. Um, and the cultural issues and the strategic issues can really make you run into a brick wall pretty fast if you don't accommodate for them. Um, the other thing here is to prep the culture so that you understand that some of this is experimental because in every company, Community dynamics are slightly different. You're, you're working with a different customer base. You, you're likely trying to do different things and affect different business outcomes with your community. Um, so every company who gets into community needs to experiment a little bit with, with small measures within the community. And some of those are naturally not going to work out really well. But really those are just learning opportunities for you. They shouldn't really be seen as failures but they need to be presented the right way to the stakeholders within the company so that, they, that you're not um, getting dinged for that per se, but people understand that you've now progressed and learned something and, and know how to do um, content and programming correctly, or um, you learn something about policies and guidelines and what your constituent base will accept. So those are some of the really big things to think about first. Um, and I'm going to hand it over to Adam. And Adam, if you would tell us a little bit about where you started from um, and what some of the issues and opportunities were when you started out, that would be fantastic. Yeah, thanks, Rachel. And I'm uh, learning more and more about the model, which I, which I think is great. And, uh, you know, I think it applies to, to the B2B side uh, just as well as the B2C. Uh, you know, a little bit of, of more about, you know, where Palladium Group is coming from. Uh, you know, you could see some of our lines of businesses, and you could call them silos. Uh, you know, just like any organization, there, you know, they have their own uh, P and Ls and, and, and such. And so, I, I mentioned we're, you know, primarily a consulting business, but you know, going around here, you see, you know, we're a publications business. We have a partnership with with Harvard uh, Publishing. 
Uh, we have certification programs. Uh, we have our own technology uh, training and, and conferences and events. And so, uh, you know, the, the glue that kind of holds all these things together is this, uh, the methodology of the balanced scorecard that I mentioned before. So, you know, if, it, if it's an event, if it's consulting, whatever it is, it, it's all related to strategy and performance management. Uh, so that, that's the glue, and also the, the people, our customers are the glue, because they're the same people who may get certified, who would come to our events, who would buy our technology. So, you know, as I said before, you know, we've recognized that we have this community out there, but, you know, Rachel, you're right, you know, we have, you know, just like any other organization, those silos and those, and those, uh, those tensions and, and those things happening here. So then when we launched the community, um, we were in beta over the summer and we just uh, launched it fully a couple months ago. Uh, you know, it's an interesting evolution that, that we're in the midst of right now, which is that in, in a way we started almost as another, uh, not a startup, but another product. It's its own, it's its own area, the community. And, I, you know, I report to one of the managing directors here. Uh, you know, it's housed somewhere. But it's also the vision, and, it, and it's happening right now, is that we're in the middle of all these other um, pieces of the organization, and we're kind of the glue uh, that's bringing them together. So, you know, we're looking at how we bring consulting uh, onto, the, onto the website, onto the awareness platform, how do we uh, deliver our uh, publications, which have normally just been sent via mail. Well, let's put them online, let's let our members email them to each other. Um, but of course, you know, with each, each one of these, you have your own questions, because the publications in the past days, those were sold. So are they, you know, sold at the same price? Uh, certification programs and events, you know, how do we do events online? Each one of these areas has its own interesting story as it kind of merges together with, um, you know, with, with our community platform. So it's, uh, it, it's definitely an evolution. It sounds like you're, you're culturally adapted to community because you've been doing it for a long time, but the strategy piece is an interesting one because you have all these different business models for all the different groups. Absolutely. And, you know, on the cultural front, you know, and it, it, you, know, it, you, you know, you can place someone, you know, you can say, you know, they're just at the beginning of the culture, they're at the end, but really, even with a company with 250 people, you know, we have 250 little mini cultures. I mean, there's, there's some consultants here who, as soon as they heard we're doing a community, I mean, they jumped right in and they're, they're helping me moderate and they're leading private groups and they're all over and they're making the most of it. And then you've got others. So, you know, you can tell by their skeptical faces, you know, it's going to take a long time. And, and they're all fun to engage with, but, but it's all over the board. Yeah, absolutely, which is a great lead into kind of the second phase, which is uh, a merchant community phase, which is, it sounds like maybe where, where you're headed from an online perspective, which is we've decided we want to do this online community. We have software. We're, we're building the infrastructure. Um, and we're starting down this path. You consciously flipped from we're checking this out, we're seeing if this is a model, to yes, this is something we want to do, and we have a goal in mind. Um, and the benefits of this phase are really um, can be very exciting because the early participants, some of them are very excited and they really understand um, where you're trying to go with that, and they can see the future state and they really become evangelists, and that's a really exciting um thing to see take off. Um, more people are aware of the tools and the models that you want to use, um, so it, it's starting to get some um, awareness within the organization. The risks of these, this phase is, is also pretty anxiety producing. So this phase is a really a make or break phase in some ways. Um, a lot of the stakeholders uh, often get really impatient at this phase to see evidence of ROI and scale. Um, and again, what I said about the dynamics is, you know, early on you really are going for engagement and passion and evangelist versus scale. Um, but you get the tension of, well, when is this going to pay off at the scale I need it to to support the business? And, and that tension is really prevalent, particularly in this phase. Um, and within this phase, you're also starting to see how things actually play out within the community. Um, and so there can be a lot of inconsistent or unarticulated expectations of what's going on, both from the community managers and from the stakeholders. And actually, uh, one of the things that we're trying to do in the marketplace is to better define what community management does and can be expected to do, 
because we feel like they're, the expectations of that role are actually all over the place right now, and a lot of them are really unarticulated. Um, and so there's a lot of burnout from people in that position when that happens, because they're getting a lot of demand from the community manager or the, the community participants, um, and, and yet they, they can't really affect the change that those participants are asking for internally. Um, so there's a lot of um, tension from, from that aspect. Um, and then even if you have policies and you plan for them, some of them just don't work out in reality the way that you might have expected, and participants may be confused about this. So it's really a phase of figuring out what works. Um, and as you do that, um, there's inconsistent education and understanding about what it is that you're doing. So the focus in this phase really is around policies, tools, and content that really drives that engagement within the community. Um, so, Adam, I'm going to flip it back to you and have you talk a little bit about now that you're up and running, what are you doing to, to make sure that that engagement is happening and how are you going through that process of making sure everything's understood and consistent? Yeah, you know, I think we, we listened to your advice, Rachel, early on and really focused on deep engagement. Uh, so, you know, we had our, you know, our, our founding 10 and then our first 50 and our first 100. I mean, we could have gone out, out of the box by inviting uh, really 100,000, we, you know, we have, we have 100,000 people who get our newsletter. So, you know, we had all the names out there, but we were very conscious of, you know, kind of getting a, a burning critical few to become really passionate about it, to become believers, and then open it up and kind of set the, have the culture set, you know, the kinds of discussions that we want, want to have there, you know, what's appropriate, what's, what's not appropriate. So we spent the summer doing that. Uh, our goals were to have, you know, just a few hundred people doing it, and they, told their friends so we ended up having a little bit more, which, you know, which was great, and, and then we launched fully with about six or 700 uh, in, in September. But, uh, you know, I think you're, you're, you're right. I mean, we're experiencing what you're talking about in terms of the, 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 the question and the balance between, you know, who is this community for and, you know, what, what results does it need to deliver back to the company? And I think it's, it's important as a community manager that I'm a little bit different from all the other employees here, and that I, I serve a few masters, and if I and if I remember the order, then I'll I'll, I'll do well and I'll still have my job. And ironically, if I really need to view my uh, primary my primary uh, stakeholder as the community members, our customers, and and if I listen to them and if I follow them and if I help them build the community they want, everything else will will come into place. So, you know, we have to recognize that, you know, we're doing this community for the community members, also for ourselves, for the organization, and thirdly for, for partners that we have. So that, but that order is very important, especially for the community manager. And even in terms of how I spend my day, you know, there are so many, there's so many meetings and so many things internally to, to sort through. You know, in the last slide that, that I showed you, and I showed all the different departments, so, you know, so many different uh, ways to pull that into the community, but I have to remember to spend a few hours at least a day with my community members, because if that ball gets dropped, everything falls apart. But I think at this stage, <laughs> and, and, and I wrote down this key question <laughs> that I imagine uh, many companies will have at, at this stage. We really faced this about five months ago. Uh, as you launch it, you know, is there a team? You know, is, are you going to be making money at, you know, right out of the gate with this thing? Uh, and, you know, we decided to have a, uh, a free service for those who qualify for the, the gated community that we launched. Uh, and then, you know, in, in my experience here and also in the, in the last community that, that I worked at, it's, um, it's, it's very important if you take that step of launching for free that you have two very solid value propositions lined up. One is the value proposition to get the initial people in the door and to get them enjoying the free service, but then in your back pocket, you better have a deeper level of uh, premium service that, you, that your, your door show people are going to pay for because the honeymoon is going to be over pretty soon and you're going to have to be delivering results to the rest of the organization in terms of helping their bottom line and, and other departments, but in most cases, you're, you're also going to have your own P&L, or in many cases, you have your own P&L, and you've got to show that the community itself is is, uh, is doing well. Yeah, absolutely, and and there's a variety of ways you can slice and dice that um, 
business model for community. There's uh, everything from sponsorships on the B2C side. There's more of the advertising models. Um, I've seen communities do things like paid listings, um, premium tools, not just content. So there's a variety of things you can do on the business model front. But absolutely, this is where you start defining what is possible from a business model perspective and where, where is that in game. Absolutely. Great. Um, and, and so then the, the next phase, obviously, is you've got a successful community. And that's pretty cool because it's actually uh, paying off and you're realizing business outcomes for the, the process or the function that the community is supporting. Um, the company has this, this active network of uh, customers or participants in the community that are, are helping um, drive down some costs of marketing and sales, particularly on the marketing side, um, or cost of information management on the internal side, or cost of customer support. Um, most of the company understands the role of the community managers. Um, if they're a functional uh, lead in the community, they understand their role there. The members of the community understand what the community is all about, um, and that's all goodness. Um, some of the risks that happen in this, this phase are uh, a little um, hard to anticipate some of the time. What we're seeing in, in some companies is that the community management function is deprioritized because the com community is up and running and successful and it can, it can help itself. Um, and this usually goes bad in one of two ways. Either the community activity really drops off for tickets Precipitously, um, and Tom Humbarger, if those of you who know him, uh, he had a great stat on his blog about a community that he managed, stopped managing, and, and he tracked the fall off um, in activity from not having a community manager. So that's one option. The other option is the community decides to be an activist community, and they decide to go in a completely different direction than the company really wants them to go. Um, and they really begin to cause a degree of trouble. And so you actually really need strong community management at this phase so that the activity of the community stays within the bounds that the, the hosting organization and company needs it to and maintains its focus to do that. Because like Adam said, it's all a balance. Um, it has to return results for the hosting company, but it also has to serve the needs of the community members, um, and that's a constant balance, and, and this phase is where that can really go askew if you take your eye off the prize. The other thing about communities, once they're at steady state, um, you really do need to refresh the programming and, and do some new things within the community, or it tends to kind of teeter out a little bit because it's, it's not new, it's not fresh, it's not delivering new value to the members. Um, the other issues here is communities are often still separate from core operations. They're not really fully integrated. Um, and management understanding is still pretty concentrated with a few individuals. So the, the focus here um, is really on community management and membership and maintaining that um, enthusiasm and engagement that you got as you were ramping up. And, and this is actually where you scale as well. You reach more and more people, and the community is big enough that it can absorb more people. Um, so, Adam, with that, kind of talk a little bit about what you want and see from the community on an ongoing basis as you, as you build this out and mature. Yeah, thanks, Rich. So, you know, thinking about your, the four steps of your model, you know, as I mentioned when we had the conversation before the webinar, I, I think we're probably at this stage three. I, I, you know, this, this seems to be what, uh, what we're doing right now. You know, we're finding, uh, you know, we're finding where we can, you know, really find that both, uh, you know, the community is serving the community as well as, as Palladium, finding the sweet spot. So some examples are, you know, we're seeing that the relationships are developing online and some of those are developing into fuller consulting engagements. Um, with our events department, we're seeing that the, having a community can drive people to the events. Uh, but, you know, but as you said, you know, this is a, a very interesting and potentially dangerous time because you don't want to just start selling to the community members and push 
too hard. Um, but the, the great thing is that, you know, now that the community has developed, members who are, say, going to an in-person event start talking about it online. And they do the selling for you. So whereas, you know, last year before we launched the community, you know, our event team would, you know, would just promote the events, you know, through email and, and, and that sort of marketing. Here we have members naturally marketing themselves. And then it continues after the event as well. They talk about the event, so the vibrancy continues online. Uh, so there's, there's that nice continuum. Uh, you know, once I put a challenge here on the bottom, something that, that I'm, I've been, uh, you know, wrestling with here at, at Palladium, and that I didn't have at my, at the former company. My, my, the last company I was with was a very small uh, headhunting firm that decided to launch a community. And for them, it was very clear, you know, what, what business they were in. They're in the headhunting business, so we had, you know, we just had to very, it was very clear, okay, let's figure out at, at some point how this community helps their bottom line on, on the recruiting side. Here at, at this firm, because it's a little bit more complex, and we have five or six lines of businesses, um, one challenge, and, and, and I think other larger organizations would have this, is to find, you know, those first early wins, you know, which products or which departments are really the perfect ones to bring over first and which ones are going to take a little bit longer. Mm -hmm. that's, that's actually excellent because I, I've talked to a lot of community managers in more mature communities, um, and, and one of their issues is the community can contribute to so many different business outcomes how do you choose? Um, so that's a really important um, learning that, that you just brought up. So thanks. Uh, um, the last phase, uh, and not very many companies are here yet, um, is extending the community out beyond just a functional group and, and really out beyond the corporation or the organization that's sponsoring it and really making it a networked community. And, and in this phase, you're really creating becoming a market maker with your community. Um, and it's really the conduit for your organization to uh, interact with your entire market. Um, there's obviously a first mover advantage if, if network is where you want to be in the end. Um, and it can be very powerful because you end up knowing more about your market than anybody else does. And that's a great place to be. And you also become the indispensable piece of your market. Um, because you're, you're basically hosting the party or hosting the market. Um, and I sometimes use SAP as an example here in their S&D business. They're not quite here, but they're definitely at the cusp. They have a million, more than a million and a half members in their, their uh, BTN and SDN communities. Um, their partners find business through the community. They're really hosting uh, an entire market there. Um, and, and so that gets to my second point, which is partners are getting a high percentage of their revenue through community activities. So you're really enabling not just your own business, but other people's businesses. Um, and again, really powerful visibility into what's going on. Um, and, and that's a huge win for, for any business. Um, the risks here or the challenges are that this really requires strategic long-range vision from the the very senior level of executives. Um, it has to be a company-wide choice that this is what you want to do and how you want to approach the business. Um, the second risk here is that the community um, becomes powerful and the company has to recognize that power at some level and really negotiate it. Um, it, it can be a very um, kind of touchy, delicate thing to manage, and again, community management is really important here so that both sides have a better understanding of each other, um, and, and those people with power within the community are getting incorporated into decision-making at some level, um, and, and that they understand that and they learn to kind of appreciate that and act as evangelists, even if they have criticisms of, of what's going on. Uh, and so the tone of engagement becomes really critical as there's more perceived power by community members. Um, and so the focus on this stage is really at the leadership level. Um, it needs to be at that level to get to the phase of community. Um, and Adam, I don't know if you want to talk a little bit about kind of where your vision of this is as, as kind of part of a bigger network than Palladium. 
you know, I'll tell you, Rachel, you know, we're, we're fortunate in that, you know, our CEO is really the ultimate driver of this, you know, uh, and, and this is the slide that, that he uses. So uh, I, I would agree, you know, to really make it to this, to this final stage, you know, you have to have leadership from, from the top. I don't think it's uh, – well, I think it would be a very difficult road for a community manager to do it by him or herself. Uh, but, but we have that vision, and, you know, one of the tools that we're using to – to get there is the private group functionality. You know, I know I'm jumping jumping into the specifics here, but we're just finding this you know, incredible potential to um, to peel off uh, different members and provide different services in private groups, uh, and in terms of helping the business model and then expand it. And you know, these different private groups can pull in different people from from Palladium uh, and, and provide different services. So that's really our vision. You know, now that we have established the culture for the community, uh, the trust that's there, uh, you know, we're going to expand at the same time. This is, you know, where we're going to be charging uh, charging members, um, and but we'll be putting a lot of energy into that uh, in the coming months. That sounds great. You're effectively creating market segments. That's right. And, and they, they do duplicate you know, the existing market segments that, you know, that we have. So, you know, a risk private group, you know, that relates, you know, to, to the risk consulting services that, that we provide or, you know, by industry or for those who are building an office of strategy management. So it's kind of duplicating, you know, what, what we have. Uh, yeah. But it's, and, and it's a great capability. We, and one of the reasons we chose awareness also is that they have strong groups capability. I think it's, it's really vital for... B two B communities, especially, I imagine B two B too, but to have that capability. Yeah, absolutely, awesome. Um, that's a great vision. Um, and and with that, I want to kind of bring it back to the, the model, um, open it up for questions, and also mention that for people on the webinar today, we actually um, have a special offer for you. If you go to this URL at the bottom of the page, uh, until the end of November, we're offering a discount on our own membership. If uh, you're someone who uh, is uh, fighting the battle alone and, and wanting a little more information and resources and some access to peers uh, and some best practices, uh, feel free to check that out. We'd love to have you. Um, and, Mike, I'm going to hand it back to you and see if there's, there's questions for us. Uh, that was great, guys. Yeah, I mean, I have a ton of my own questions, but um, we got a ton out there during the section as well. So, um I hope you don't mind if we're just going to jump right into get everybody's stuff. Um, by the way, just so everybody knows, that th there were a lot of questions, so if, if some of the questions we don't get a chance to get to during the Q&A, um, what we'll do is we'll, you know, we'll circle back with each other and, and distribute them out and do our best to respond to everybody individually. So please don't think we're ignoring any of the questions or, you know, we don't want to ask them. It's, it's, uh, we just want to be cognizant of everybody's time on the line. Um, Rachel, I think this one's more for you, and, and, and Adam, feel free to, to give your opinion as well, but... Um, how do you avoid a few community members, uh, you know, the ones with the loudest voice, the ones that are contributing the most, becoming overbearing or intimidating the other members of, of a community and, and possibly discouraging them from, from contributing? Um, that's one of the toughest things you can, can deal with in a community because it, it often gets very personal. Um, and I would say it's that ongoing negotiation and ongoing facilitation um, unless they're being belligerent, violent, et cetera, you want to try and, and keep them within the community. Um, I, I think it's really important to have pretty strong operating guidelines for your community. Um, and, and for those of you on the front end of this, uh, it's a good recommendation. And one of the things I say is the, the legal terms of service, but then there's the, the policies and practices that that you use to manage your, com or your community. Um, and I think they, they need to be both the, the positive things that you're trying to encourage and the negative things that you're trying to discourage. Um, and, and I think keeping very firm about that is really important. And I think, um, you know, I don't actually have a problem with asking somebody to leave if they violated that. that those are the terms with it, which they accepted community uh, membership, and if they can't abide by them, then they're really not being a community or a productive community member. Having said that, you know, giving them some chances, um, talking them through that, giving them some 
love and attention and, and listening to them. Often listening is what they really want the most of. Um, but then there's the other side of people who really just want to cause trouble, and, and those people you really have to understand that that's what they're doing and, and get them out of the community because they're pretty destructive. There's so many reasons. Adam, have you ever had uh, any issues with that? Well, you know, both, both communities I've been involved with, uh, you know, we had – uh, it, you, know, you had to register to get in, so there was, you know, we, and you had to use your real name. So we didn't have people like cursing for the most part, and you know, saying inappropriate things and being offensive. But in both communities, the, the challenge we have is uh, kitchen selling to each other, because uh, we, we've tried to. Both communities were meant to be um, real peer communities where professionals were talking about their issues, and. Uh, and, and there's meant to be no pitching. So that's the uh, that's the thing we have to watch for, and it's often it's often difficult to detect, actually. Uh, and, and, but but we we have had that, and then you know to Rachel's point, it becomes a very human process. You know, first step is you know just kind of a gentle reminder. You know, these are, these are the terms. Please no selling or pitching. Um, and then. Yeah, you know, that usually takes care of it. Uh, I haven't had it go too far. I have one colleague who talks about the rule of a thousand. You get a thousand members, you're, you're going to get one who's, who's particularly troublesome. I've, I've kind of found that to be true. And, and Rick, this just kind of a follow-up question that just came in from, uh, from David. Um, how do you empower community managers to address difficult hot-button issues uh, regarding your organization specifically? Um, and, and just as a follow-on to that, do you have any advice for creating policies? Um, and, and when to engage senior management in any of those responses? Um, this is part of where I talk about knowing yourself as an organization um, and, and knowing what those hot button issues are and where where the uh, scope of tolerance is for discussion within those areas and where people go out of bounds. So that requires a lot of internal work to just make sure the community manager understands um, the leadership issues and hot button items. Um, once you do that, I think it's really important to lay out scenarios. And, and in the calmness of your office, um, think about, well, if I get asked about this, what's our party line? What's our response to this? And a response of we're not prepared to talk about that right now is perfectly legit. Um, but just plan for that as much as you can before it happens. You won't be able to plan for everything, uh, and, and the community manager sh should um, run those scenarios by leadership to make sure that um, they okay all of those actions. And if that's the case, then if one of those stakeholders gets upset after the fact that the community management has then gone and done this. They can at least be reminded that they had the opportunity to tell the community manager ahead of time that that's not how they wanted that transaction to happen. Um, so that's kind of my advice on that level is a lot of free scenario planning and wargaming um, can be really helpful just to get everybody aligned on, on kind of what the scope of discussion. Uh, and Adam, is that something that, that you guys did at Palladium as well? Yeah, I think it's, it's also important for the community manager to know his or own, or her own limitations. You know, so for example, here, you know, we've, we've got many people uh, who have been doing this balanced scorecard thing for years and years, some serious experts, and the members themselves, some of them have been doing it for decades. Uh, so I am not always the expert. In fact, in fact most cases I'm not. So I, I need to play a different role, which is kind of the glue between the community members and each other and the community members and other experts inside of, of Palladium Group. So sometimes I can speak on behalf of the company, but more often than not, you know, if they're asking, if they're talking about some very detailed question, you know, and about health care and implementing, you know, this sort of measure, metric. Uh, you know, there might be one person inside the company who knows that, and uh, I have to set the tone of, of what I do, and I have another colleague who's a, who's, a, who's a moderator, of being able to say, great question, you know, let me go find out for you. Uh, you know, acting kind of as the glue between, between everybody. Uh, so we can wear a different hat as, as, the, as community managers, and I think that's important to know your own limitations because you don't want to go out and say something and get, get yourself in trouble.
That's a great point. That actually is a great segue to, to something I heard yesterday. Someone who's a lot smarter than I am uh, brought up a point that when you're launching a community and you're building a community, that really everybody in your organization becomes a community manager. And I thought about that a little bit, but I figured I'd get their take on it. Rachel, is that something you agree with? Um, I, I actually wonder if we should bring Jim into that conversation because that's a little bit of a uh, a uh, soapbox item for him, which it, it does kind of segue very nicely with Adam's point, which is um, one of the most important things that our members as community managers do is internal evangelism and training on how to engage with the community. And for really good community managers, the way that they scale is to train a bunch of little community managers. And little by, I don't mean small or insignificant, I mean um, they duplicate their skill sets, um, both with leaders within the community and other employees that have expertise. Um, and I think it's really important, I, I love that in point, it's really important to differentiate between content experts and community management. They're not the same thing and they shouldn't be the same thing, um, particularly in areas where um, there is a really rich expertise set, doctors or lawyers or, you know, if it's a professional community particularly, um, that's a really important point. So. Yes, I think everybody can be a little bit of a community manager, and the more people you have playing some of those roles, um, the better the community functions overall. Jim, uh, I unmuted your line if you have anything you'd like to add to that. Well, that's, you know, there's a lot there, but um, it's definitely true just in talking with um, a lot of different companies about building community. They don't realize it, but, you know, we've talked about how they already have community um, and in a lot of cases, the folks that are supporting customers or supporting partners, they're essentially doing community activities even though they don't have a an online community presence. And so a lot of times it's just a matter of talking with them about some of their current activities and just translating it to an online community environment. Mm -hmm. Adam, what do, you, what do you think? Do you agree with that? Uh, absolutely. And, and I view it as, as a significant part of my job to – uh, get other folks here deeply involved in the community. Um, you know, there, there is also a balancing act there, too. You, know, you, you, you don't want to overwhelm uh, the community with all sorts of comments from folks, say, at Palladium, right? We don't want to have 10 to 1, like the comments and activity are, are, are you know, from, from folks here. So there's a bit of a balance, and what we're doing is um, we're, you know, we've been, we have about 10 or 15 uh, Palladium groups experts on the community right now, and their, their profiles are highlighted and they're active, and over time as we, you know, get into the thousands and thousands of members, we'll bring in hundreds of Palladium folks, so we want to have a, have a balance. Cool. So final question, uh, we're getting close on time, and I think this one may uh, push us over the limit because we've had a bunch of different questions around it, and it's probably one, Rachel, that you get all the time, and I'm sure, Adam, you know, everybody in your organization is probably paying attention to it as well. What metrics do you track? Um, to define success in a community? Are there specific things that you look at that depend on the community? Um, what recommendations do you have? Um, it, to me, it very much depends on the business outcomes that you're looking for. So um, I'll just give you an example because it's fresh with my mind. I did a, best, uh, a case study on how we use Twitter. And for us, we were really trying to drive awareness with that tool. And so we were looking at the amount of retweets and engagement and um, how many people were signing up um, and, and going to our website and viewing our posts and retweeting our posts versus retweeting stuff that we just passed along. Um, and, and so that was very – we got very specific about that. Um, and so I think it, it really varies quite a bit depending on what you're looking for. And I'm a big fan of um, kind of keep it simple and, and stick to three to five metrics that you're tracking. The other mistake that I think people make is because community uh, community dynamics are such that they are lumpy, don't don't track them every day or even every week. Like we we track our activity on a month over month basis because we don't feel like there's any one thing that that moves the needle so much in a day or a week uh, that it matters to the overall success uh, trajectory of the community. So um, that's a really hard question to answer. 
Um, and it's really, and actually it's no different than all your other business functions. You already have metrics for tracking number of leads or lead conversions or whatever you're, you're attempting to do. Um, those are the same metrics you should be tracking in your community uh, if you're aligning to business outcomes. Adam, if, you know, if it's, if it's too uh, sensitive um, information, what, what, you don't have to answer, but what are you guys tracking to define success within your community? Well, you know, the things that I, that I track, uh, and, and they don't go too, too much beyond me and, and my boss, are, you know, things, you know, everything from open rates of the emails we send out, and it might be interesting to compare that to, say, you know, your general marketing emails. You know, is it more compelling to your community to open things that feature what other community members are talking about versus purely what you as an organization are talking about? Uh, everything from that to, you know, how many comments, uh, you know, a, a day or a week, some sense of, of the vibrancy of the site. But then ultimately it comes, it does come down to revenues at some point. You know, and, and, and here it is, you know, how, how are we performing in terms of members, paying members, uh, and, and partnership revenues, you know, for the, for the, um, for the community project on its own. And then more generally, you know, has it driven uh, business in the other in the other lines here on the consulting side. Okay. Example. No, that's great. That's terrific. I appreciate um, both you know you and Rachel taking some time and Jim as well uh, to be with us today. We're you know we're we're a little bit over, um, but I think you know we got a ton of questions and there's some great uh, feedback uh, both on Twitter and and within WebEx. So, uh, Rachel, I want to say thanks uh, for for taking some time to spend with us today. Adam, same to you. We really appreciate it. Um, and hoping to have you back. Thanks for having us. No, we appreciate it very much. And, and for everybody on the line, if we didn't get to your question, like I said, we, we'll do our best to follow up with each and every person that submitted something. And, you know, again, uh, uh, complete apologies if we weren't able to get to it, but we'll do our best to get back to you in the next 24 hours or so. And thanks again, Bye. everybody, for joining us. We really appreciate your time, and, and hopefully you'll, you'll join us again in our next session.